Welcome everyone. Thanks for being with us today to talk about um, our wonderful, wonderful Safe Pregnancy and Birth app. It's always really exciting to see how many folks are using our tools and books and things around the world, um, but also especially to hear stories about how they help you and your work and your families and the people that you care about and love. So we want to stick to time today, don't want to keep anybody longer than we said we would. Um, but I just wanted to start off with asking folks, if you don't mind just popping it in the chat, what are you hoping to learn today? Um, just to kind of get a sense of, of who's in the room and what brought you here. Yes, looking forward to hearing Racha speak about her work. Also thinking about um, midwifery education around the world. I always think I teach um, in a public health program and I talk to my students about how having that sort of perspective is so informative for how we can transform the way we do work and engage and interact with each other um, in the US, but also you know evolve our relationships with each other. And I see a welcome from Zambia. And it's great that you are um, here, Elizabeth, to learn about the app. And this was kind of your, I guess you hadn't heard about it before, and this is good. This will be your first experience, exposure about the app. So that's really great. Thank you. Welcome, people from all over the US and the world. This is great. So I guess we'll um, get started. Is that okay? One of the great things I think of all of the variables and books and this app is that, um, you know, so many of us, of people use them in daily practice and they have really, really enhanced how everyone can work and also make sure that people have access to quality health care, health services, and really open up the right to health for everyone. And we have here today um, Racha Tahani Lawler-Queen, who is doing just that. Um, Racha is a fourth generation midwife um, who lives on Powhatta shop Shaco Musqueam territory, um, known as Richmond, Virginia today. Racha is a certified professional midwife, licensed midwife in California um, and Virginia, and also a certified Sangoma. Racha is also a farmer and a beekeeper and has over 20 years of experience um, supporting home birth families. Racha, thank you so much for being here today. I was, of course, um, excited to hear you talk about Hesperian's app and how you use it and how you've been using it for a long time, um, and at least how you've been using Hesperian materials for a while, and also how you, um, you know, recently opened last year Gather Grounded Midwifery, which is the only Black on birthing center in Virginia, and it was really wonderful hearing how you opened your um, midwifery or gather ground at midwifery in response to stories that you were hearing about representation and you know feeling welcome in the birthing environment from um, particularly black midwives. So um, so welcome. Thank you for being here. I just wanted to start and ask if you wanted to just talk a little bit about how you have used the app and also because you've used the book for a while so how do you see the book and the app kind of working together um so thank you for having me leah i appreciate it so uh, first i just want to clarify gather ground in Wifrey is um the first black owned birthing space in central virginia um the first is actually um, a black midwife by the name of uh, marcia marcia jackson who just recently um, stepped away, but her birth center still is in existence in Northern Virginia. I was very excited when Hesperian reached out to me and asked for me to speak about my experiences with their 
products, their books, and also the app. Um, the, the book, A Book for Midwives, was my first textbook about traditional midwifery. It was my first opportunity to engage with a book that was gonna teach me midwifery, um, support my education in midwifery, but where I saw myself, where I saw black midwives, where I saw indigenous midwives, where I saw traditional midwives um, being spoken of as uh, authorities on natural childbirth, on um, traditional midwifery practices. And so this has been a book that I have carried from you know, being a baby midwife who was just early on learning to um, going to midwifery school and having it with me there while I did you know, my examinations and learning. And then it became the book that I would ask all of my learning midwives, student midwives to get the first document. The first book I asked them to buy was a book for midwives. And there are lots of textbooks that uh, midwives have to find, use in order to, you know, become certified professional midwives or to become licensed midwives to sit for our exams and study and, and learn from. But this one in particular just always felt like I saw myself and I saw the type of midwife that um, I was for my community represented in this textbook. And so it has been something that I've been very passionate about for a very long time. And I'm excited and honored to speak with y'all today. Yeah, I want to ask you just a follow-up question um, of you saying that you were able to see yourself. How do you, you see that kind of transferred or translated into the experiences of your your students um, and the the learners who are kind of becoming midwives? That's an excellent question. So a book for midwives was the first midwifery textbook where I saw um, actual uh, pictures, drawings of Black midwives with head wraps on, Black midwives with aprons and traditional garb on. And all of that was affirming for me as a, as a Black midwife, as a practicing midwife, as a learning midwife. And in the United States, midwifery is predominantly white. And the teachers and the educators are that, and thus the textbooks are that. And so for myself as a learning midwife, a black midwife, a young midwife learning, um, I felt more empowered by this book. I felt supported and I felt seen. And I also felt like some of the things that I'd learned from my grandmother, from my grandmothers or from um, other elder midwives were reflected in this book. Yeah, so one thing that I actually have written down for your introduction that I did, didn't say is that you are a fourth generation um, midwife, or maybe I did say it, but it really stood out to me. And so thinking about, um, you know, history and transformation and change, um, how has the app kind of worked to um, enhance your practice, if I can call it that way? <laughs> yes. So... <laughs> I was so excited about the app that I like ran to TikTok and did a TikTok about it because I was just like, <laughs> people need to know the book is an app now. Like I was just, I was over the moon because for me, what the app represents is accessibility. So, okay. you know, people that are in academia, those of us that have to study and take tests and um, be in the world of test taking or in the world of studying, we're used to reading books, we're used to cracking books, we're used to going and reviewing through books, but a lot of people now coming up, if it's not in an app, they're just, they're not interested. They're not gonna engage with it. And yeah. so for yeah. some of the new midwives that are coming up and everything is on their tablet, their iPhone, this was a perfect accessory, a perfect addition to our midwifery toolkit. So mm -hmm. instead of having to, you know, back in the old days, um, go and get my bag and go get my, you know, book for midwives and go through the index uh -huh, uh -huh. and find the section and be like, okay, this is the thing. It's so great to have this app where you can punch in, you know, what is it that we're talking about? Is it first trimester, second trimester, third trimester? Is mm -hmm. this something that, you know, we can find the recommendations here within the app or some things that people could mm -hmm. just figure out on their own? Yeah. Um, it just, it was 
exactly right on time for the times that we're in right now, because a lot of people also are living more minimalist um, lifestyles. So they don't have shelves of books. They don't have libraries in their homes anymore. And so this is really taking this really valuable, important textbook and putting it in a way that is easily accessible for many. For anyone who might be watching, um, what would you say to them in terms of, um, you know, Hesperian's book, but also the app and how mm -hmm. they, you know, maybe there's something they haven't thought of um, that this tool could bring to their work um, or something else? <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking about this and I was looking at the, the most recent edition that I just received from Hesperian, thank you, um, and gave to all of our learning midwives. So we have a group of midwives that are gonna be starting uh, next year in a one-year program that basically provides them the opportunity to experience their midwifery education in a way that is um, culturally affirming. So all of their preceptors, teachers are black midwives. And then um, they are also being fiscally supported. So we received a grant so that they're getting an income while they're learning. And one of the things that was really important to me was that we we're reducing as many barriers to them getting the education that feels like the type of midwife they wanna be. And so Hesperian has been fantastic about making sure that lots of different types of midwifery are represented, but the book for midwives specifically was for traditional birth attendants. So those that are in rural, far out, outside of the country, maybe in places where resources are low. And what's very interesting is that a lot of Black midwives serving in the United States, families, cities, counties, sometimes the midwifery we practice feels a lot like that. It feels like low resource. It feels like not a lot of support. It feels like, you know, you're really figuring things out on your own. And so this, this book has been time and time again for probably decades now, actually I can say for decades now, has been a true resource for the traditional midwife, for the midwife that is practicing out of the United States, outside of the US. Um, and so then to have this app, what I love about the app is that they've taken those extra steps and made it gender inclusive. They're talking about different folks' pronouns and how people want to be identified in their pregnancy. So we're not even just got this amazing book, but with the app, we have something that's now the book with the appropriate information for the families that we're serving now. Um, and I support a lot of families that don't want me to be at their birth. So families that are planning on birthing unassisted or birthing you know, without a midwife present, and this is an excellent resource for them. This is something that they can read and that they can be educated and be supported in making educated decisions that, you know, maybe not everyone else in the world supports, but, you know, sometimes we as midwives can't get to families that are in very far rural places because of our practice or because of, you know, the limitations. We have families that live in the mountains. We have families that live where the closest hospital is three hours away. And so this book and the app together are really meeting the needs of a lot more people than probably Hesperian even considered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate, I always highlight that I'm from a rural area um, in Southeast Texas, and it's one of the many parts of the U.S. where the labor and delivery, for example, has shut down, and the closest um, place to go have a baby is about an hour drive away. And um, and so what you're saying really hits home for me, and I'm sure lots of other folks who are watching. Um, I wanted to see if we have any questions, but before, or at least during registration, some folks had questions, and um, if you don't mind, I can ask you a few while we have time. Happy. To. Um, all right. So one of the, one registrant asked, um, what is the role that you see as a midwife in your work um, regarding family planning and birth control as part of reproductive rights? So that is a great question. 
licensed midwives in the United States, the, the capacity of how we can show up for our clients with regards to their reproductive health around family planning is varying from state to state and sometimes even county to county. So for example, when I lived in Los Angeles, I have a CPM and I have an LM. I have a national accreditation and then I have a state licensure. In Los Angeles, I couldn't get a job at a reproductive health clinic, a very well-known reproductive, re reproductive health clinic that supports people in uh, family planning and also um, abortions. But when I lived in the Bay in Oakland, I could work at that same clinic. I could be paid as a midwife to work in that clinic and work under a doctor's license or a nurse midwife or a nurse practitioner's license and be able to support families with um, pill abortions and prescribing and helping people figure out what's the best type of birth control for their family. We also talk about um, traditional midwives outside of the hospital, outside of clinics. We talk about some of the natural family planning methods, which is fine for a family that is like, we would be okay if we had another baby. But we also have to talk about the options for families that are like, no, we're absolutely complete. Like we're good, we're, we're done here. And so talking about what the options are available to them as traditional out of hospital midwives, our role and responsibility requires us to provide resources and access to our families, even if it's outside of our scope. So where we can't provide abortion services, we can help protect those um, rights for families. Hesperian has an amazing app that literally can help anyone in any state, any country find their resources for safe abortion, which is another reason why I love Hesperian. Um, but as a midwife uh, that works out of the hospital, it's my responsibility to make sure that I have the professional relationships with those in the community that I can refer families to if they want a form of birth control that is outside of my scope. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered the question. It does, thank you. Um, and then another question was, um, and maybe you can draw yeah. from even your family experience um, and historically, but how do midwives in different places support themselves um, economically? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have nurse midwives that work in hospitals and clinics and they're paid by those hospitals and clinics and by insurance. Most insurance companies will pay nurse midwives without any hiccup. Um, then we have licensed midwives we have um, uh, certified professional midwives and we get kind of a harder rap. We, we definitely have to work harder to meet the criteria to even be considered for some insurance companies to offer our families reimbursement, not they won't pay us upfront, they won't pay us directly. And so in the United States, um, black midwives especially have a much harder time because the majority of the clients that we support even if they have um, an insurance, private insurance, or maybe like a premium insurance, they're at best gonna get a reimbursement rate of 70 to 90%. And then if they're getting state insurance, um, if the midwife signs up to be a provider with state insurance, it's not a lot of money. And for some states, if the family ends up going to the hospital, whether it's an emergency or non-emergency, the midwife is, does not receive compensation. So the, the out-of-hospital midwife, the midwife that supports families at home or in birth centers or in birthing spaces, um, we're really reliant on our community and our clients to make their payments on a regular basis. Um, they usually are working through payment plans where they pay a deposit to secure their midwife and then they make monthly or per appointment or per trimester payments to be paid out, to be paid in full by the time they give birth. And that makes it possible for us as midwives to, you know, keep the lights on, make sure we have all of our equipment today, that we have Wi-Fi for our apps <laughs> and things like that. But yeah. most out of hospital midwives are not um, the the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, then, you know, hopefully they have an assistant or an office manager that helps with, you know, making sure that there is income happening, that people are making their payments and that um, the needs are being met of the practice. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for that. I, especially the, the insurance piece that you were talking about 
is um I had no idea those companies <laughs> yeah yeah so, yeah so there are um a couple of questions in the chat um yes can the app also be beneficial um for birth workers as well or do you feel like it's exclusive for um the no. profession yeah this this is a great app for anyone that is in birth work anyone that is supporting pregnant people newly postpartum this is a great app this is a great app for care providers that are taking people to their prenatal visits. The app um, has a section where it's how to support those that are uh, disabled, those that have limitations. And so if you are their care provider and you're going with them to the prenatal and you have access to this app, maybe they have forgotten something to ask their midwife, doctor, nurse practitioner, and you as the helper or the family member or the birth worker can reference this app to be like, well, you know, um, just saying, for example, you know, my family member is an amputee. I don't think that they need to birth on their back. You know, can we talk about other birthing options? And that's in the app. Like the support that it provides is going to be of benefit to anyone that is supporting people that are having babies. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then another yeah. question is asking about um, the power of networks and support and reaching people. And they ask yes. um, if you, when you think about, um, I just, let me just write, read what they said, um, wanting to know if you think about the network um, you refer to, how large is that network? Um, and how many people do you kind of refer for assistance and services? throughout your network. So every midwife's <laughs> every every midwife's network is different. It's based upon how you show up in your community. And so when we talk about four generations of midwifery, I used to say and I still say it sometimes though I can't I, it doesn't apply now that I live in Virginia, but I used to say when I lived home in LA that I had midwifery nepotism, which is really not something you hear about in the black community. Um but midwifery nepotism meaning when I would have to take families into the hospital for a transfer, whether it was emergency or non-emergency, there were people there that remembered me when I was little and my grandmother worked at that hospital. My grandmother worked on the unit. She was in labor and delivery. And there are people that she taught how to catch breech babies, how to catch twins. And so those folks now as elder doctors, when I would walk in, they would say things like, you Mary's baby and I would be like yes I am and please be nice to my client <laughs> so our network is as big as the people that we call into it and that we make these good you know professional um relationships with you know for many years and in many different places Texas California Virginia it is it is not a badge of honor to be the only black midwife what it means is that then I have to show up in a very specific way in hopes of it being easier for the midwife that's coming after me. And so I have a lot of resources in Los Angeles because of that, where if I was walking in the door, people would be like, oh, there's that black midwife. And I'd be like, yes, we're here. And please, you know, act right. Um, and making nice with people, making relationships with people so that I could refer those families and other midwives to those same providers, the safe spaces, you know, for all times, black people have had to create our own collection network of safe spaces, mm -hmm. places where we could go and we knew it would be safe or with the, the caveats of, well, this is a safe space as long as this person is here, or this is a safe space as long as you're out of there by this time and day. And so I had that coming from midwives, being born and raised in LA. And then I had to grow it and I had to build upon it whenever I was outside of those spaces and places. And then I keep those relationships so that families in California could still call me and be like, so what's the doctor I should reach out to? And then here in Virginia, I'm meeting those people and I'm forming those relationships, those networks. Yeah, no, that's really beautiful. Um, and I think that you know, as Black people, that we've always had to build those sorts of networks and be our own resource where the system doesn't, isn't there for us. So um, that's really beautiful, especially considering what birthing means for 
Black people and the continuation of us and our histories. Um, so I actually, so we don't have time, but I, um, <laughs> I was about to ask a really big question and I'm gonna try to put it in two or in one small question um, because I wanted to give you the chance just to talk a few minutes about what you've got going on. Um, if there are, you know, we definitely wanna share your socials um, and any developments in what you're doing. But I also have been thinking as you're talking about, you know, tradition and history and, um, mm -hmm. and you know, and like keeping those traditions alive and flowing through the people. And mm -hmm. I, what you were saying about the app made me think about, you know, the decolonization movement and how the Hesperian's materials, at least the, for you and your work, it really is, does seem to be helping you to reclaim um, what a industrialized healthcare system um, had, is trying to continue to take away from, um, from our people. So, so thank you so much for your work. Um, but if you want to use the last couple minutes here to tell us what you've got going on, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, yes, there's a lot of really exciting things that um, I feel so passionate about and I'm grateful for this opportunity to share it. Um, at the beginning of Black Maternal Health Week, which will be next week, uh, it's a week dedicated to just really shining a light on the huge impact, um, the deficit in healthcare and how it's impacting Black people in their birthing, in their parenting, um, and really just focusing on how can we be better? How can we do better? What can we do to turn this around? Uh, in the 20 years, 20 plus years I've been a midwife, uh, it's only gotten worse for black families and those numbers with regards to death and, and illness and injury, they're just getting worse, they're not getting better. And so Black Maternal Health Week is specifically targeted to highlighting those that are doing the work, highlight the places, the safe the safe spaces to go and receive uh, care if you are someone who is needing any type of reproductive health care, not just people that are having babies. And so uh, my contribution to it was first opening Gather Ground in Midwifery here in Richmond. It's right outside of Richmond in Midlothian and creating a safe space for Black, Brown, Indigenous, and queer families to receive care. So that was step one. And we've done that. Thank goodness, lots of support from lots of people have made it happen. But now the next step is that this place still needs black midwives. It can't just be one or two of us that live here and then people that live far away driving in because the community has said, you know, where are our midwives? And so uh, next week we will be sharing with the world but we'll share here with Hesperian uh, the launch of the traditional midwifery um, freedom path. And so what it is, is uh, three midwives that are from Richmond, Virginia area, currently living in the area, are going to be apprenticing here and student midwives here at Gather Grounded. And so, as I said before, they will be culturally supported through their apprenticeship. So all of their preceptors and midwives will be Black, traditional midwives, nurse midwives who are committed to making sure, we are committed to making sure that they're skilled and that they're feeling confident and that they are being affirmed in their process, but also diminishing the barriers in doing this work. And so they will also be paid a stipend every month to support them in their education so that they don't have to worry about their bills. They don't have to worry about childcare. They don't have to worry about you know, the things that a lot of midwifery students have to worry about and hopefully make a smoother path for them to becoming midwives in Central Virginia and supporting Central Virginia families and the community coming to know them. So that that's the biggest thing and that's huge and I'm really excited. We received funding for our first year and we are gonna be seeking funding for our subsequent years so that hopefully in a very short period of time, less than five years, we have more Black midwives in Central Virginia. So folks can find me at Gather Ground in Midwifery. Thank you. <laughs> folks can find me at Gather Ground in Midwifery on Instagram and TikTok and also Rashad Tahani at uh, Instagram as well.
I am so sorry that I mispronounced your name. <laughs> I should have asked. <laughs> we were, I was like, thought I was going to get on early enough to just like, but it's okay. Yeah. Don't worry. This is my whole life. This is being, this yeah. is being black country. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I know it wasn't with Madness, yeah. so don't even yeah, worry. I mean, that's like bad form for me as a moderator. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much for being here. It was very lovely to spend this time with you and to hear everything that you're doing. Um, like really, truly all the best. And I'm definitely going to go and follow you everywhere I can. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. I hope I answered everyone's questions. I'm going to try and look in the chat once I'm muted, see everyone's questions. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks to Rasha. <laughs> and um, yeah, and you can find Rasha's um, uh, socials and website and things, um, YouTube channel even in the chat. And now we wanted to, um, after hearing how Hesperian's app and materials have been being used in the U.S., we wanted to also check in with some um, abroad, check in with some partners abroad to see how they have been using the app. And um, the first partner we will hear from um, is our partners from um, Iway Community Development Network Limited in Uganda. And um, sorry. I thought I had my screen share ready, but I did not. Um, and Iowa's work focuses on human rights um, with a special mm -hmm. emphasis on education, health, gender equality for marginalized um, populations. And um, they have been working with, or Iowa has been working with us at Hesperian since June of 2023. Um, and has been able to reach nearly 150 medical practitioners, 1,500 commercial sex workers, and 800 um, young women and girls. So um, we will take a few minutes to hear from um, our partners in Uganda. I'm Nadia Gomiraj. I'm uh, the team leader at Iowa Community Development Network a feminist network based in Uganda that advocates for access to sexual reproductive health and rights. We envision a world where women and girls have a right to lead their sexual and reproductive lives in a safe and dignified manner. With support from Hesperian Health Guides, I was implementing the Assess and Disseminate SR apps and one of the apps is the Safe Pregnancy and Childbirth Mobile app. And today we are here to ask, um, ask some health workers, in particular a midwife, about uh, how they interact with the app. Midwife, Auri Diana, work at Family Medical Point, I'm a unit head maternity. Uh, I self birth app, they have helped me so much as a midwife. I personally have hundred mothers several times using this app. The self bath, I've always attended to mothers, teaching them on how to use it and advising them on urinating every time, frequent mutilations during labor. I've handled mothers after delivering the placenta, that is in the third stage of labor. I've used the app to manage bleeding, postpartum bleeding, and advise them to use the castor oils, that is to get painful contractions that sometimes are dangerous. Continuation of using this castor oil could cause more painful diarrhea, strengthening the contractions, and that's how we manage to have safe deliveries. Uh, here, I've used the hub mostly on antenatal mothers, that is before giving birth, that is on their journey during pregnancy. Here, mothers have been educated and they have downloaded this app really. They are using it to know the diet, to know the dangerous signs in pregnancy, to know which position is their baby lying, and it has helped them count the days. Eh? We have the calculation eh, in this app, eh? so mothers have got to know when they expect their deliveries, following the pregnancy calculations. At 
the family medical point regards partnership with the IWI network. We've managed to have mobilizers as the end organization. So these mobilizers work hand in hand with the midwife, our coordinators to reach out to the far communities and we promote awareness in the far community. This hub has promoted a lot of privacy. People are able to do a lot of things without coming to the facilities. Affordability of this app, this app is a one-time download that people download it once and it's over, so it is easy to use. We do conduct for continuous medical education. Here we follow this app and other people who are not midwives, they get to know the knowledge under maternity. We partner with other organizations and other facilities. So in this partnership, we still conduct CMEs and get more awareness. The first mother I got, she came in, she's, she's complaining of fetal movements, you get? Fetal movements, those are the movements, the baby is trying to rotate and play in your stomach, you get? So she was a teenage mother, she didn't know what really happens with pregnancy. so I used the app to reassure this young mother and she left when she is okay and she, she surrendered to always be using this app to know more about pregnancy. I had a mother who had a safe delivery from her, from home, but she still followed this app, but she didn't know how to use it more. So I reached out to her, she had a lot of bleeding following delivery, that one is postpartum bleeding. She was bleeding a lot from home, so I used the app to handle her from home. Here I gave oxytocin, 10 international units, as the app says, and I really managed her well, and I left when the bleeding is managed. Thanks to our partners in Uganda. And now we can hear a few words from Sarah Shannon, um, Hesperian's executive director, just about um, how partners are using the apps and why the apps are so valuable. Wow. Well, thank you. First of all, Lee, thank you so much for uh, for moderating. Um, I don't know if you actually introduced yourself, so I will. This Lee is one of our really wonderful board members, and we're grateful for all of the generous ways that Lee supports our work. So thanks so much for moderating today. Um, and it's lovely to see everyone. Um, these, are, these are some great examples of how people are using um, the safe pregnancy and birth app and really exciting. And I thought I would just share a few more since we couldn't invite every partner in today and time zones are always a little challenging. And there may be some of you all on this call that wanna to share too, but um, just to kick this off. Um, and actually I'm, some of these are examples of a previous iteration of this app um, because Hesperian has a kind of a practice of continuous improvement of our apps and um, the Safe Pregnancy and Birth app went through some changes that Tanya can describe uh, later or we can talk about later. But it folks have been using this app in a lot of different ways as midwives. One way that has been shared with us a lot, and I'll give an example from Kenya, but I think it's really true globally. And I think Russia and others have alluded to this as well, is that um, it's a really useful tool to facilitate a conversation between the midwife and family members or the pregnant person, or often the pregnant person and their family and support about danger signs to watch for, things to be reassured about that aren't danger signs that, that you know you should just be aware of about what's important in a healthy pregnancy as well as any specific conditions. And um, we're really pleased to have done such a good job of incorporating disability into this version of the app. That's one great example that we already heard about. So the ability to sort of talk with family members and show them the app and then have the app be something that they can then refer to again has been one of the ways that uh, midwives in a lot of different settings, Kenya where midwives needed to talk to male family members and Showing them the app was a really easy way for them to get the male family members engaging about what were danger signs and how they needed to be prepared to support somebody who was quite far away from a hospital or a delivery center and, and might need support to get there quickly. 
um, Chiapas, Mexico, another example where indigenous midwives were using the app to talk with community leaders about promoting prenatal care and also ensuring good transit when there are emergencies. Most births aren't actually uh, problems in there, but their obstetric emergencies do happen. And so raising awareness about when is it an obstetric emergency and when is it not is actually an important part of uh, some of the outreach that midwives have been using the app to do. Um, we have had examples of people using the app a lot around training midwives as well and training community midwives and um, training outreach workers who are sharing birth information or being birth workers themselves to connect people to community midwives, particularly where those networks are just diffuse or where people are living in really rural areas. So those are just a few examples and I bet there's some other folks on this call that would have more to share. Um, but I. Uh, wanted to just kind of acknowledge that the app is, I think, currently in use in 136 countries. So there are stories of midwives literally um, pretty much around the world of using the app. Yeah, well, thank you, Sarah. We do have um, one more community partner um, to hear from, and that is um, partners from Ecuador at the School for Traditional Midwifery Unachu Mumakuna. Um, and this midwifery school um, emerged from the need to continue passing down ancestral knowledge and to maintain community health, um, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and there was a first class of nine traditional midwives that graduated in 2023. Um, and many of the students uh, have been trained using Hesperian's A Book for Midwives and are using the Safe Pregnancy and Birth app um, as they practice in their local communities. So we can hear a little bit from them now. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Eh, soy Marta Rotingo, directora de la Escuela de Partería Ancestral Luna Chumamacuna de aquí de Cotacachi, Ecuador. Y bueno, yo soy partera ancestral y me dedico a acompañar mujeres en gestación, parto, posparto. Eh, quisiera contarles un poco sobre la experiencia que nosotros hemos tenido con los libros que nos han eh, donado desde Esperian. Sí, eh, han aportado mucho al aprendizaje de las estudiantes que están en la, en la formación y que bueno, ahora ya son parteras. Eh, durante la formación, pues el, el libro nos ha ayudado mucho, sobre todo en la parte médica, ¿no? Como el tema de, de cómo reconocer señales de alarma y peligro, eh, cómo, cómo a, apoyar o cómo darnos cuenta en el momento del parto si es que una mujer está en, en un riesgo, por ejemplo, como estas cosas más clínicas que, que, que nos ayudan mucho a nosotros. Además de esto, pues ellas tienen la posibilidad de, de, de continuar con este libro usándolo y a, apoyándose de, de este material en, en sus casas tenido que acudir al libro y el libro ha sido de mucha ayuda porque me ha ayudado a recordar y un poquito más a fortalecer y así poco a poco he ido he ido leyéndole y también entendiendo algunas cosas que no que en el momento no entendí y me ha ayudado a seguir fortaleciendo el conocimiento que fui adquiriendo tiempos atrás. Eh, hola, mi nombre es Andrea Paucar, eh, tengo 22 años, soy de la comunidad de Perafán y Y me dedico es al cuidado, al cuidado antes, durante y después del embarazo, de las mujeres, de los niños y de todas las personas que me necesiten. Mi nombre es Inés Bonilla, soy de la comunidad de La Calera. Eh, soy partera y tenemos un don, ese espíritu de poder ayudar a las personas más necesitadas, comprometidas para poder salvar vida a las mujeres. Yo he leído este, este libro en donde eh, dice todo eh, paso por paso cómo se debe eh, atender a la paciente. Entonces, si es que está en eso de embarazo riesgoso, tenemos que llevar al, al hospital. Entonces creo que el trabajo tanto de la partería como parteras en la comunidad y como el hospital tenemos que trabajar juntamente. Es más fácil también guiarnos aquí para ver los riesgos si yo puedo atender en la misma casa o llevarle.
Pero sí. nosotros también nos estamos haciendo acompañar de la aplicación de Esperia, ¿sí? la aplicación de embarazo y, y parto. Eh, esta aplicación ha aportado mucho en el acompañamiento a las mujeres. Eh, la aplicación solo ha sido como un poquito complicado al momento de descargar. Bueno, el no saber también creo que es. Y después ha sido fácil porque ahí eh, cualquier inquietud que tenemos mmm, eh, nos va resolviendo y a la misma vez eh, es mucho más fácil poder decirles a las mujeres, miren, hay esta aplicación, descarguen, esto les puede ayudar, porque hay muchas veces que eh, hay mujeres que no pueden fácilmente preguntarnos y decirnos, así seamos mujeres, no nos pueden preguntarle las cosas y hay mucho recelo, mucha vergüenza, entonces se les puede dar esta aplicación y ellas con más seguridad, más confianza pueden revisar sin estar pensando de y ahora ellas se enteraron de esto o qué van a decir de mí, entonces ya tienen eh, su propia confianza y seguridad de poder verla, ver y por sí mismas eh, saber cómo eh, va funcionando nuestro cuerpo. Mi nombre es Blanca Bonilla, soy de la comunidad San Antonio del Punque, y soy partera. La tecnología, como aquí nosotros, como parteras, hay, habemos personas también que no sabemos leer bien y también no sabemos manejar bien en la tecnología que está avanzada en estos tiempos, pero sin embargo, sí, sí nos ha ayudado bastante. Hay muchos, hay mucha ayuda en, en la aplicación y, y para seguir aprendiendo de la misma manera, para seguir ayudando a los a las madres embarazadas, para cuidado. La aplicación a mí también me está sirviendo mucho y a las compañeras, entonces eh, estamos muy, muy contentas de poder usarla. Eh, sí, la, las experiencias han sido muy variadas, eh, muchas de nuestras compañeras no, no tienen educación formal, pero eh, están haciendo todo el esfuerzo para poder utilizar la aplicación y también poder eh, tener una herramienta ¿no? para su trabajo y acompañamiento. Thanks to our partners in Ecuador. And um, as Sarah said, we did want to, um, and I think we are right at time, just in case anyone um, does have a question or two, maybe we can take a couple of questions if that's okay, because we do have Tanya Litwin here who um, helped develop and create the app. And so in case there were questions um, regarding, you know, what is the app? Um, just wanted to give space for that just in case, but I do want to respect everyone's time. Um, there's a question, um, how difficult is it to translate the app? Um, it's not, it's not difficult at all. Um, and we can, one of the things about, um, this app is different than the previous app and we can create a, an app with multiple languages in it. So the family planning app and the safe abortion app are in 11 languages, whereas the safe pregnancy and birth app, because it's basically new, is just in English and Spanish. So it's pretty easy. Um, there's, you know, translators need to get paid and then, you know, it's a little money to actually build it and create the, you know, wrap all the words in code and go and make it go into an app. Um, but uh, yeah. Okay, well then um, while we have you and I guess Sarah and to wrap up, I'll give you the last word um, in case you want to share any plans or, um, particular successes that you've been very proud of just to wrap us up and send us home? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the um, one of the things I just want to say, I don't know how many of the people here used the previous Safe Pregnancy and Birth app, but it was really focused on danger science. And early on, we got feedback that People wanted an app that also talked about what is a normal birth so that they could better rec recognize what is a danger sign. So those are two halves of the same thing, right? And so that was sort of, we have sort of four overarching sort of themes that ran through this um, update. 
um, which kind of turned it into a new app. It's not more than an update, let's just say. Um, and one was mental health and how it affects people because of the community you're in, before you're pregnant, during your pregnancy, and then of course after birth and the um, and how how to better support people. So that's one piece that we got loud and clear, and we added that information throughout um, all parts of the app actually, um, and really struggled with how much of it is about um, the larger socioeconomic world the individual lives in, and that's hard. We have to work at a different level to change that, um, and then. We added birth, which was missing in the previous app because we were only talking about danger sites. Kind of a, <laughs> a big thing in a pregnancy app to not talk about birth. Um, and then we also extended the birth um, and sort of demystified that after birth piece for the first seven days. And I think um, that piece um, is really hard to contain, right? Because uh, it could easily turn into an app of its own. There's always pressure when building an app to keep, to draw the line in the sand about keeping it short enough that people can still read it. Um, and I I heard Danny saying, this is long. We have people that need more pictures and I, I hear you. Um, and one of the one of the other things we did is to make it more accessible. So we it's longer, but it's, um, we really tried to make the language more accessible. And a big thing we did was add more pictures so that if somebody, all the accordions have pictures, all the how-tos have pictures. And that means if you're kind of reading and you're kind of looking at pictures, you can navigate better. And I think the how-tos specifically, um, people had trouble. It's a skill building section um, that has 22 different skill building pieces. And um, that section, I think was, it had a lot of words and a lot of words repeated and it was just hard to navigate in the previous one. And yeah. so really simplified that one. Yeah, well, thank you, Tanya. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We really, I mean, the work that you and everyone at Hesperian has put into the app um, is clearly making a huge impact on people's lives and their um, midwifery practices. So, um, so thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And we hope to see you at the next one of these.